Hebrews chapter 2. We're going to read four or five verses here, and uh, I hope this will be a blessing to you, like it was to me, reading it over again and studying it today. Thank you, babe. That works. Okay, let's just read verse 9 down through verse number 13. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9 down through verse number 13, all right? But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that He, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. For it became Him for whom are all things and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one. Amen for that. Amen. For which cause he is not ashamed to call them, meaning us, brethren, saying... And this is a quote from Psalm 22, verse 22. We'll look at it later. Saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the church, while I sing praise unto thee. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children which God hath given me. This this shows up often in the book of Hebrews and other places where Paul is quoting something from the Old Testament. And obviously, he doesn't give you chapter and verse because the chapters and verses came much, much later. The scriptures didn't have chapters and verses. In fact, there wasn't even any break at the end of a sentence. So when Paul would quote from something, he's just quoting to a place in the Old Testament. Now, we can go back and find a chapter and a verse for it, But sometimes he would just say, and again, it says this, and again, it says that, and again, it says this and says that. And so there's several quotes here from the Old Testament. And what we see in these five verses are four things about our Savior. One of them we've already talked about quite a bit. I mean, four things about Jesus Christ. First of all, in verse number nine, we see that he is our Savior in verse number 10, we see that He is our captain. In verse number 11 and 12, we see that He is our brother. And surprisingly, in verse number 13, we see that He is our Father. That's a strange one. But it's speaking about Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is Savior, Captain, Brother, and Father. Now, obviously, there's other things He's also the bridegroom and, you know, the head of the church and other things. But these five verses speak about those four things. Remember, it's kind of giving us a picture as to who is going to run the world in the millennium. And it emphasizes these four things. Savior, Captain, Brother, Father. Now, Savior, we've already talked about quite a bit. But one thing, before we go on to Captain a little bit more, I want to go back, if we could, and just touch on one thing concerning Savior in verse number 9. Go back and look at this. It says, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. All right, He came as a man. And it tells you right there why God had to become a man. For the suffering of death. All right, For the suffering of death. Of death. It couldn't, he couldn't come as an angel. He had to come as a man who could die. All right? So he came for the suffering of death. God became a man to die for you and I. It says, crowned with glory and honor. We know where that happened in his ministry when he was taken up, when he went up to the top of that mountain and was transfigured before his disciples. Uh, and before Peter, James, and John. And it says that he, by the grace of God, should taste death, experience it in other words, for 
every man. I just want to touch on, before we go on to the next verse, every man, every man. It's one of those passages of many in the Scriptures that make it clear that Jesus Christ did not just die for the elect. He did not just die for some pre-selected group of people uh, that were pre-programmed to believe at a certain point in their life. Last night, I happened to watch a movie. Um, it was a documentary uh, called uh, Tears, The Tears in the Wheat. I don't know if any of you have seen it. I don't even know. it. Maybe it's been out for years. I mean, I just, I just saw it last night. But it's, the, it's a documentary concerning the rise and fall of Harold Camping. I don't know if any of you remember that name, right? But back in the uh, you know, early 2000s, he had a, uh, a nationwide radio program, had a lot of followers here in our area, and, um, and, and he, he was a false prophet, but he believed he was a Calvinist. He was a five-point, full-blown Calvinist who believed that God pre-selected before the world began certain individuals who were going to go to heaven and pre-selected others who were just created just to go to hell. Just created so that God could then prove His sovereignty by sending them to hell. And the, this was his doctrine. Now, he had some other flaky things, but that's what he was most known for. In fact, he had a famous track, the track that they normally passed out. You and I might hand out a track that would say, you know, that God loves you. His track said, does God love you? <laughs> that's what the name of his track. Does God love you? Because, of course, if you weren't one of those pre-selected individuals, then God didn't love you. He did not really love you. In fact, they, you know, in the track, I have the track at home, he said, if you're not one of those pre-selected individuals, God actually hates you. But God loves His own and loves the elect. But you know what? This kind of flies in the face of that, doesn't it? That Jesus Christ would taste death. It doesn't say for the elect. It says for every, for every man, for every man. And there's so many other verses in the scriptures that back it up like these. John chapter 1 and verse number 7. You can go there if you want. John chapter 1 and verse number 7. It's speaking about John the Baptist, who of course came to announce the arrival of the Messiah. That was his job. He was a prophet. And uh, verse number 6, John chapter 1 verse 6 says, There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men, that all men through him might believe. That all men through him might believe. So right from the beginning, the announcement from John the Baptist was that here's the Messiah and the, and the purpose of his coming is that all men through him might believe. 1 Timothy chapter 2, we read that just before we went to prayer. If we had gone a little bit further in 1 Timothy chapter 2, it says, it tells us to pray for all men. Right? All men. And it even, you know, it doesn't say pray for the elect. Right? How would you know who you were praying for? If, it, if you and I were just supposed to pray for the elect, it says pray for all men and uh, all of those, even for kings uh, and those that are in authority. Notice how the Lord sticks phrases next to each other so that you see that words mean the same. Uh, for example, if you're there in 1 Timothy chapter 2, it says, verse 1, again, giving thanks, be made that prayers for, what are the last two words? All men. All men. All right? Why? Well, verse 3, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved. Amen. The purpose, the reason for praying for all men, he tells you right in the context, this is good and acceptable with God our Savior, who will have all men. Well, if we qualify verse number four to mean just the elect, well then, it certainly doesn't match verse number one. I'm supposed to pray for all men. For what reason? Because this is good and acceptable with God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved. I ought to pray for them for the sake of their salvation. And um, so that certainly is clear, that who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge 
of the truth. Of course, other famous verses, you don't have to turn to all of these, but 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, the Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish. And the us-word there, right? Who is the us? Well, it says, not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us-word. In other words, to mankind. To mankind. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But that all should, that's His desire. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4, this one kind of kicks, you know, and, and sadly, sadly, um, brother, I, I don't know if he was a brother, Harold Camping, I, I don't think he could have been a brother, but anyway, Harold Camping, who professed those doctrines and who had a lot of people all around the world believing that, I think in May the 21st, 2011, Jesus Christ was coming, and you remember the, uh, the nonsense that went on as that date got close. In fact, we were, we were on a mission trip in the Philippines in April of 2011. <laughs> and right there in downtown Butuan City, in the middle of nowhere in Mindanao, was a gigantic billboard that, with that announcement on it, right? And so we decided to go street preaching right under it, but, but making sure that people knew that this is, this is not the truth. <laughs> This is, this is not the truth, because the Lord could come today, He could come next year, no man knows the day or the hour, this is not the truth, this man is a false prophet, and then sure enough, in the movie, the documentary made, uh, somebody, uh, the, the guy that made the movie embedded himself in that group for about a year leading up to this, and had access, you know, they, they opened up their homes to him, and he was in their homes of some of these families that were following that, and he was interviewing them, and and, and all the way up to the day, you know, and then, of course, the next day, and how demoralized and defeated, and then they even showed the reporters coming to Harold Camping's, the door of his home, knocking on his door to try to get some statements from him the next day, and as you know, he suffered a stroke, and I don't know if he even survived very long after that, but suffered a stroke and lost the ability to speak after that. But... But, his, but the, the most reprehend, other than just falsely predicting the Lord's return, the, the fact that he so boldly and with seemingly without any compassion or anything just would state that, you know, um, only certain people on that day of judgment on May the 21st, you may, you may be one of those that are going to get raptured, but maybe not. And so, you know, basically like fatalistic, just awful. But Jesus Christ tasted death for every man. He died for all. 1 Timothy chapter 4, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10. For therefore, we both labor and suffer reproach, because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. Hmm, what do you do with that? Especially of those that believe. All right. So, yes, my Savior, because I believe, but Savior, He's not only Savior to those who are saved. He's Savior in a special way to those of us who have believed. But He's the Savior of all men, because He tasted death for every man. All right, so every man there in that case means every man. Um, 1 John chapter 2, 1 John chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. Go there, 1 John chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. My little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Wow. What do you do with that? The propitiation. A propitiation means... A sacrifice that satisfies wrath. So, Jesus, so propitiation is Godward, not manward. Right? Redemption is manward. Propitiation looks Godward. 
God sees the blood. So the propitiation is a sacrifice that satisfies the wrath of God and allows God now to extend grace and mercy to all mankind on the basis of faith. But that propitiation is not just for some supposed elect pre-selected before the world began. It's for all men, not only our sins, all right, that would be if there were, you know, pre-selected, a pre-selected group, but not just those who are saved, but for the sins of the whole world. So he's a propitiation for all men. He's the Savior of all men, especially those who believe. He's a propitiation for all sin, ours and the sin of the whole world, right? The whole world. And by the way, whole world, that little, little expression, right there in that verse is, it's found seven or eight times in the Bible, um, but that expression right there, for the sins of the whole world, is the fourth from the last. That expression shows up three times after that in the Scriptures. And all three times after that one in the Scriptures, it speaks about the wickedness, the evil, the, de- the deception. For example, it says, We know that we are of God, and the whole world lieth in, witness, in wickedness. The whole world. Now it says he's a propitiation, not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. But when the Lord uses terms, the rest of the time in the Scripture, that expression, the whole world, is consistently means all of humanity, even the wicked. The Bible speaks in the book of Revelation that that Satan, or the, the Antichrist when he comes, will deceive the whole world. So it's not the whole world of the elect. It's the whole world, all mankind. When the Bible says that God so loved the world, He meant the world, the whole of humanity. And He tasted death for every man, not willing that any should perish, but that all men might be saved, the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. And then 1 John 4 and verse 14, that's why it says here, It says, we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. The world. All right, so when it says in verse number 9, back there in Hebrews, that He tasted death for every man, you know what it means? Exactly what it says. (laughs) It means exactly what it says. We don't have to parse that. We don't have to read between the lines. We don't have to give it some kind of a spin or our own private interpretation. We should allow the Bible to speak for itself. And, and a Savior that didn't care for all men, it kind of makes the story of the gospel, I don't know, less than the love story that it really is. And if men were pre-selected to be saved, and then at the appropriate time they will believe, because also that's what uh, Calvin taught, is that regeneration happens before faith that the Holy Spirit regenerates the person, and then once regenerated, they believe. So really, it's completely out of the sinner's hands. At the appropriate time when God says, okay, now, boom, press the button, you're regenerated, and you believe. Where's the love in that? Where is the wooing in that? Where is the, where is the Spirit of God uh, grieving and, and, and wooing men to Himself? It's not a love story. That, that one is not a love story. It's no wonder that the track would have to say, does God love you? <laughs> you know what I can say? God does love you. God does. Saved or lost? Saved or lost? That's the God of this Bible. God is love. God is love. So he tasted death for every man. That makes the cross a real true love story. That's what makes the cross the most magnificent, not just the demonstration of the sovereignty of God. Of course, if he's all powerful, he could do anything he wanted. And it takes the love out of Calvary. But that's a, that's a true love story on the cross. It's Jesus Christ suffering and dying for a world that he knew for the most part would reject what he was doing for them. But of course, if they never had an opportunity to believe and it was beyond their power to believe and they really couldn't believe, then there's no tragedy in that. They couldn't have believed anyway, so where's the heartache? They were only created to be burned in hell. There's no heartache there. But the cross is a sad, sad story. It's a sad story. It's a joyous, victorious story for you and I 
because I see the love of my Savior. I see the love of my Savior. And I see Jesus Christ, His compassion, His sacrifice, tasting death for every man. So I see Jesus, my Savior, in verse 9. But then in verse number 10, we see Jesus, our captain, and it speaks of Him as a captain, not as a Savior, but as a captain. Salvation is the focus of verse 9, but salvation is not the focus of verse number 10. Because then those who are saved, guess what? Your Savior becomes your captain. The one who died for you, tasted death for you, then what does a captain do? He leads the way. He goes before. He initiates things. He leads the charge. Remember when Joshua in chapter 5 was getting ready to go up against, um, 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 what was it? <laughs> Comple- Jericho. Okay, completely escaped my head there. All right, he's getting ready to go up against Jericho, and he sees a man standing over there on the side and uh, goes over to him and finds out that it's the captain of the Lord's host. It's Jesus Christ. And it's no angel. It's the Lord himself because he's told to take off his shoes like Moses was told to take off his shoes at the burning bush. And Joshua is told to take off his shoes because he's standing on holy ground and he bows himself to the Lord there. So Jesus Christ is the captain. He's our captain. And the first time we see him mentioned there as captain of the Lord's host, there's about to be a battle. So this this speaks about warfare. This speaks about conflict. This speaks about, you know, trials. This speaks about suffering. And sure enough, in verse number 10, in the context of our captain, we see a suffering is, is mentioned here. And we see our captain. Let's get back there. Let me find it again. Um, Let's go back to the text, Hebrews chapter 2 and verse number 10. We see, For it became Him for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory. Bringing many sons unto glory. So these are, these, we became sons in verse number 9, let's say. Because 9 is about salvation. There's the Savior. But now in verse number 10, He's not bringing sinners to glory. So this isn't about salvation. This is bringing those who are already sons, who are saved. Now, those who are sons, who are born again, are now being brought somewhere or brought to something, right? Because glory is not a somewhere, it's a something, right? Heaven is heaven, and in heaven is glory. Because the Bible says in Colossians that the glory that is laid up for you in heaven. So glory is a, is a thing, is a something, And so, once you're saved, once you're saved, you're already a citizen of heaven. You already have everlasting life. But just because you're saved doesn't mean that you and I will be glorified, all right? Because what's involved in a child of God being glorified one day? The Scriptures always connect one word with that. It's in this verse, suffer. Suffer. It's not like, you know, it's not like the priests that whip themselves on the back to prove how much, you know, how devoted they are. But it's talking about dying to yourself. Someone said every morning they have to die. And if they don't die, they'll never be able to live right, walk right. If you don't die, you can't live properly. If you don't die to yourself, if we don't take up our cross, and learn the suffering of putting our own flesh down, the suffering of putting your own will down, the suffering of putting your own pride down, the suffering of being patient when you want your way, when you need a solution and you need it now. Man, that's painful to just say, Lord, I'm going to leave it in your hands. I I need that right now. You know, it hurts. It hurts our flesh to have to wait. My flesh doesn't want to wait. Your flesh doesn't want to wait. We don't want to wait for anything. We want immediate satisfaction, immediate, you know, we want our problem fixed. And if it's not fixed by tomorrow at 2 o'clock, I mean, we're mad at God. And you, but sometimes the suffering that you and I have to deal with is just killing the flesh and, and learning how to swallow our pride and humble ourselves before God, which is painful. It's a painful thing to have to admit you don't have all the answers. To admit you don't have the strength or the wisdom 
to live this Christian life. It's going to take, it's going to take power from somewhere beyond you. It's going to take the Holy Ghost. Amen. And all of that is designed to humble us and make us remember. It's not to shove our face in the dirt for God to continually every day tell you, you're just a worm, you're a worm. No, it's for us to stop looking at ourselves and trusting in ourselves and leaning on our own understanding and learn how to just look to Him. Look to Him. Trust Him. Leave the outcome to Him. Wait upon Him. All of that hurts. It's painful. It's not what any of us want to do, especially if you live in New York. You don't want to wait three seconds. You don't want to wait for the light. You, know? you don't want to wait in a line. We don't want to wait. And it hurts. But that suffering is, unfortunately, it's God's plan, but that is the path to glory. The path to being glorified one day, the path to heaven does not involve your suffering. The path to heaven only involved the Savior's suffering. He did that for you. But the path to glory, the path to glory involves suffering. And your captain went that way first. Your captain went that way first. And in a sense is saying, come on. You've seen the old movies, like the Civil War movies, where the captain with the bayonet, you know, with the sword, and he, you know, his men are a little afraid, and he jumps over the wall, and he just leads the way, right? And I, I love those kind of movies where the, where the guy says, come on, you know, come on. Basically, that's what Jesus Christ is saying here. He's saying, come on, come on. And that's where we're supposed, to, we're supposed to follow him there. We're supposed to follow him. In fact, I think a cross and follow are found in the Bible a few times. Take up thy cross and <laughs> the captain goes first. All right, he went that way first. Then he can turn around and say, all right, now, take up your cross. Come on, follow me, follow me. Because that's the path, that's the path to glory. It's not the path to salvation. Praise the Lord, you just have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. But the path to glory is through suffering, through suffering. And I'm not talking about a martyr's death. I'm talking about the suffering that is needed every morning, the dying that's necessary every morning. The, the dying to ourselves and so that the Lord can get the victory and so that the Lord can get the glory. All right. Now, look at, um, wh while we're here, ta we're talking about captains. We're talking about the suffering involved here. We looked at this before, but just turn real fast. Chapter 5, look at verse 8 again. Though he, Christ, were a son, yet learned he obedience. Chapter 5, verse 8. Yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, right? Perfect was in, uh, also in chapter 2, verse 10, wasn't it? For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. So here we see perfect again, sufferings again by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. A captain and an author. In a sense, an author is maybe in a literary way the same as a captain. He's the one that begins something, right? In, in the same book, you might remember in Hebrews chapter 12, he's called the author and the finisher. So that's the beginner and the ender of our what? Our faith. So think about this. Author, we, we kind of understand that, right? But finisher... Do you know that salvation, we, we, we are so grateful and so thankful and we reflect and get emotional every time we look back and think about the beginning. But do you know that when God saved you, He had His eye on the end, Amen. not just the beginning? You weren't saved just to get you out of what you were in. You were saved, God had an end in mind. You were saved toward that end. And that end wasn't, just get in the door to heaven. No, no. The end was glory. The end from the beginning when He saved us, the end was supposed to be glory, not just get in the door. The end was glory. All in the mind of God, that was the plan. Save them, glorify them. Save them so that they might obtain the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13 and 14. Saved to obtain the glory. So, author, 
finisher, right? Author, finisher. Saved, but with an end in mind, a view. God, so when the Lord saved us, it's not just, whew, man, Praise the Lord. I look back and get emotional about December the 5th, 1975, when the Lord saved me, and rightfully so. You should too, about whatever day it was when the Lord saved you. But you know what? That was only the beginning. I mean, saved forever, but that's just the beginning. That's not what God had in mind. That wasn't the end. When the Lord was on the cross, He did not have, for me, December 5th, 1975 in mind. He had eternity in mind. And that's what you and I, I think, lose sight of sometimes. And so, therefore, we don't understand what this whole period in the middle here is all about. We, we, we don't, then, then this Christian life doesn't really make any sense. Because if it was only the beginning, then why have I got to go through all this garbage? Is it, why, do you have to, why do you have to be rejected by your family? Why do you have to suffer this? Why that? Because this is not about the beginning. This is about the end. And you know what our captain did? His whole purpose, yeah, he tasted death, but then the Savior became the captain. And now the captain is leading many sons unto glory. It's like, come on, come this way. If you and I could get a hold of what awaits, of what's waiting, yeah, we'd look back with, Great appreciation and joy at the beginning, but we jump out of our skin thinking about the end. If we could really get a hold of what's coming at the end, and we were saved for that. Not just that. Not just to get you out of condemnation and damnation. Not just to get you out of your circumstances. Not just to lift you up into some better condition and put you among some better people. No. That was only the start. And then this entire existence between that point and that point, everything in the middle, is to get you ready for that. Everything. Everything. Everything that the Lord puts in your path. And it's different for every one of us. For you, it may be a different set of trials and heartaches and struggles than for somebody else. But every single thing that the Lord puts in my path or your path is really to prepare you for the end. To prepare you so that in the end, you're not just getting in the door by the skin of your teeth. You're walking through triumphant. You're walking through glorified. It's a big difference. You say, well, won't the end be the same for all of us? Because we all got saved the same way. We all got the same salvation. Yeah, we all got the same beginning. We don't all have the same end. Same place, but not the same end in that place. All going to the same place, but glory is not a place. Heaven is a place. Glory is what awaits you in that place. If, if you and I can be faithful like our captain was faithful. That's why we have a record of his life. That's why the Lord gives us so much of an example in the life of Paul. So we have something to study and look at and say, oh, that is the typical Christian life. That's the normal Christian life. If any of us suffered 1% of what Paul went through, we would feel we were being afflicted and abused by God. Probably, right? I mean, look at some of the things this guy went through. Beaten, shipwrecked, stoned, you know, forsaken, all the stuff. If we suffered a fraction of that, we'd be crying and whining in our milk and thinking God was abusive to us. What kind of a father are you to treat your own children that way? But you and I have in the Scriptures examples. Why? We have a captain who's leading us to glory, leading us to glory. Go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13 with me real fast. I really wanted to get to brother and father because they were cool. But anyway, we're parked here for a second. So 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13 and 14. We'll, we'll just hurry if we can through this. We are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, 
Because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation, not in the sense that Calvin taught. In other words, salvation wasn't an afterthought when it came to God's plan for things. Did God, after Adam sinned, all of a sudden have to convene a meeting? You know, the Godhead had to come together and go, okay, guys, now what do we do? Can you believe what just happened down there? They just ate the fruit. Did, was the Lord surprised by any of that? Of course not. In His foreknowledge, He knew what would happen. And that's why the Bible speaks about Jesus Christ being like a lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Only because in the foreknowledge of God. And that's how... That's, that's the sense in which you and I are elect, according to 1 Peter, right? It says, elect according to the foreknowledge of God, not according to the sovereignty of God. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God. In other words, before time began, before there was a planet, before there was an atom, before there were men, before there was anything, did God know everything was going to happen? Of course He did, or else He's not God. So in His... In, in his foreknowledge, did he know that you would get saved? Of course he had to know that. And he knew who, given a million chances and, an, an, and opportunities, would not get saved. He knew you would get saved. And so we are elect. Before you were born, did God know you were going to get saved? Of course he did. But your election is not based on the sovereign choice of God. You go to hell, you go to heaven. Election is, rests upon the foreknowledge of God, according to the Scriptures. God in His infinite wisdom and knowledge of the future knew. So therefore, knowing this one, this one, and this one are going to believe when given the opportunity, then God acts accordingly. Then God prepares things because He can see what was going to happen. All right? Elect according to the foreknowledge of God. But anyway... So, chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth, whereunto, whereunto, in other words, that was, that's what God was doing through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Sanctification of the Spirit, meaning sanctification, sanctify means set apart. So the Holy Spirit works on, works, works on you based on the foreknowledge of God works on you. And so through that work of the Holy Spirit and belief of the truth, you come to salvation. That's what happens. Nobody's getting saved without the Holy Spirit of God getting involved in the process. Working in your heart, opening your eyes, giving you the faith to believe. It's a work of God. It's a work of God. And that sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit of God brings you to belief of the truth. All right? So there's salvation. Whereunto, with that in mind, in other words, whereunto... Uh, where are we? Whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of salvation. <clears throat> right? You see that? Everybody there? To the obtaining of what? Glory. To the obtaining of the glory. Right? So the gospel is calling you to something much, much more than just salvation. The gospel isn't just calling you, get saved. No, the gospel is calling you to that salvation. You become a son of God, and then that Savior becomes your captain, and he says, follow me. Follow me. Where are we going, Lord? We're going to glory. We're going to glory. And so the rest of this life is my captain going before me, leading the way, bidding me to follow him, take up my cross and follow him, because we're headed for glory. We're headed for glory. And the gospel calls you to the obtaining of that glory. Not just salvation, but beyond salvation, to glory. All right? Go with me to this one, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 10. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 10. <clears throat> Paul said, Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. All right? Not just salvation, not just salvation, but glory. All right? So salvation is one thing, glory is something else. Glory accompanies your salvation. It's the 
whole point of the Christian life, not just to get us saved, but to, and not just to get us through the door and into heaven, but that one day we might be able to be glorified together with the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 8, Romans chapter 8, let's go there. Romans chapter 8, look at verse number 16. If you've been in our church for any amount of time, probably you've been to these verses a few times already. We go here often. Romans chapter 8, verse 16. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. All right? There's going to be an inner witness. There's going to be that reassurance from within, from the Holy Spirit of God, that you are a child of God. Now, of course, the Holy Spirit, how does He speak to us? Through His Word. Not through some... You don't have to stare up at the clouds and wait for the Spirit of God to confirm with you that you're a child of God. The Holy Spirit speaks through the Scriptures. So if you're saved, he that is of God, you know, hear at God's words. So the Spirit of God, re, he confirms, he reassures us through the Scriptures. All right? And so you get that peace. As you, if you're saved, you're going to get that peace when you read the Scriptures. All right, so the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God. All right, heirs of God. And, so there's two things here. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. So that's not the same thing. There's two things here. Heirs of God, what could that be as an heir of God? What is, your, what is your inheritance as an heir of God? An heir is somebody that receives an inheritance, right? What's my inheritance as an heir of God? Salvation. I have eternal life, right? It's the gift of God, right? Eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. An heir of God, we have eternal life. But that's not the end of it. We are also joint heirs with Christ, if, notice the second one has an if with it. Now, there's no if with your, as an heir of God, there's, you, there's no suffering involved in becoming an heir of God, right? It says here, if, and join heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with Him. All right, so there's two parts to your inheritance in a sense. There's one part that you cannot lose, there's one part's irrevocable. You couldn't lose your salvation if you tried. Amen. You're sealed until the day of redemption, right? That's what the Bible says. So there's one part you can't lose, even if you don't suffer. You know, suffering is not involved in our salvation, not, uh, not on our part. Our Savior suffered in our place. He died in our place. We don't suffer in order to be saved. But why is there suffering connected with this other part of my inheritance? I'm an heir of God, salvation, eternal life, and a joint heir with Christ. If so be that we suffer with Him, with Him, that we may, what, also, be also, what, glorified with Him. Wow, suffering and glory together in the same verse, again, for like the fifth time. All right? So, that part of our inheritance is a child of God. The first part, you get saved, you believe. The second part, He's your Savior, verse 9, Hebrews 2, 9. But then... The rest of it is Hebrews 2.10. The captain of our salvation says, come on, follow me, follow me. And that journey may require some suffering on your part. And the suffering is necessary for the glory. If so be, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be glorified together. Verse 18, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Uh, 2 Corinthians, go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We won't get beyond this point tonight, but we'll, we'll stop here. And 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse number 17. Familiar, I know, for some of you, but maybe others. Not so much. Verse 17, for our light affliction, our light affliction, amazing that Paul would call what he was going through light affliction, which is but for a moment, right? So as rough as life can get for a child of God, 
as much as you may be called upon to endure. Um, the trials, the, the tribulations, the reproach that you may have to bear as a, as a Christian, um, it's just for a moment. And it isn't anything compared to what your Savior bore for, uh, for us, right? We, we can't, you know, we have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin, right? Our sufferings haven't been anything compared to what He suffered. He's not going to call upon us to suffer more than He suffered, all right? So in comparison, although... I mean, if we really look at what Paul suffered, and for Paul to lump all of that together and say it's just light affliction, he's only comparing that to what his Savior suffered. You know, that, that's the only way you can look at what you may have to go through and call it light affliction, is if you're keeping your eyes on Jesus Christ, like Hebrews chapter 12 tells us to, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher, author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, right? So we keep our eyes on that, and guess what? Then our affliction doesn't quite seem so heavy, right? But if, you get our, if we get our eyes off Jesus Christ, then our afflictions seem overwhelming and unfair. And you can get bitter about what you may be going through in life. You can get bitter, get mad, Throw your Bible away, get out of fellowship. But you know what fixes that? Turn your eyes upon Jesus and look full in His wonderful face. Just remember, go back and look at that. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, right? And you know what happens? Your burdens, your afflictions, even the contradictions of sinners against you, then suddenly... Okay, it falls into perspective. Okay, it's light affliction. But even that, but notice there's a promise in that. Look at what it says here in verse 17. It says, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us. So there's something God is working in that. Are you going through something right now that's just like, just make, I almost, almost said something I shouldn't have said. <laughs> You're going through something right now where you just like to kill somebody? Probably none of you have ever been there, right? <laughs> you've never been anywhere like as a Christian where really if it weren't for the fact that you were saved somebody would be dead you know you have been you're human and sometimes that you know that rage inside of us I mean that's the flesh and that, that anger that wrath it's real and as a Christian you're not suddenly you, don't, you didn't sprout wings you're not flying around like a little perfect child of God you get out of that book and you get your eyes off Jesus Christ, you can hurt somebody. And some of us have. But the only thing that fixes that, get your eyes back on Jesus Christ. Go back in the book. Stick your face back in the book and just look at the cross and consider it. Go back and meditate on that. Go back and look at what your Savior carried for you, what He went through, what He bore, what He bore. And you know what? Then our stuff sure feels a lot lighter. <laughs> Man, then I could actually say with Paul, yes, amen, light affliction. Thank you, Lord. And it's not in vain. And it's not in vain because it's working something in us. God is using that to work something out in our life. What's it working out? For it worketh, what does it say? It worketh, it worketh for us a far more exceeding an eternal weight of glory. Right? Author, finisher, right? Captain, the captain's taken us somewhere. The gospel called us unto the obtaining of the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ, right? Again and again in the scriptures, boy, the Bible just sort of hammers that thing. Uh, real fast here, uh, a couple more. All right, Philippians, Philippians. Go with me to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. Look at verse number 13. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. Meaning, Paul was saying, I'm not going to say I got a hold of everything I should have gotten a hold of. Amen. Even Paul could say that. Are you and I where we ought to be in our Christian life? Not one of us. Not one of us. I know that. I know you're not where you're supposed to be. And I know I'm not where I'm supposed to be. 
Because Paul himself said, I don't count myself to have apprehended. There's a lot of things I haven't gotten a hold of yet. I'm working on some things. And I want to apprehend more and more of the truth of this book. I want to get a hold of it. I want to apprehend it. You know, you know what cops apprehend. You know, Usually you apprehend something that's trying to get away. <laughs> I want to apprehend some truths that slip right through your fingers if you're not careful. You've got to hold on to them. You've got to hold on to them long enough to look at them, live them, until you learn them. Right? That's the only way we really learn things is we've got to live it. And so sometimes we don't hold on to truth long enough to really live it and learn it, and it gets away from us. And Paul himself would say, I don't, I'm not saying I've apprehended, but, watch this, but this one thing I do. Right, I'm not where I should be, but I got this thing settled in my heart. This one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, so even every one of us can do this, because Paul, Paul said he could do this. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. What's he talking about? Your latte tomorrow morning? You know, your no, the things that are before. What did the Lord put before us, right? For the joy that was set before him, right? The future, the end. There's the beginning, the end, right? Reaching forth toward those things. Those things. It's not, well, I hope tomorrow I get a better job or a better, you know, I hope next week I get the raise. No, it's not reaching forth toward those. The things that God has put before us, Right? Forget the stuff that's behind. I messed up yesterday. Forget that. You messed up yesterday, probably. Forget that. Forget it. God said to forget it. Forget those things. But don't just forget them and go on. Forget them and then turn the other way and reach for those. And look what it says. Reaching forth unto those things which are before, comma, right? There's a comma there. Am I seeing things? Is that a comma or a period? Comma, okay, so it's not the end of the sentence. Reaching forth toward those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize. Salvation is not a prize. It's a gift, right? What happens at the end of a race? The guy that wins the race does not get a gift. He gets a prize. He gets a prize for pressing. He gets a prize for enduring. He gets a prize for overcoming. He gets a prize for not quitting. Right? And for the child of God, this is not talking about salvation. You don't have to reach forth towards salvation. You had that at the beginning. But you know what's at the end? There's a prize. And it's the prize of the high calling. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, called by the gospel to the obtaining of the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's quite a prize. That's the high calling. The high calling is called by the gospel to obtain that, that in the future. So everything here in the middle is just God trying to get our attention, get us to be obedient, get us to die to the stinking flesh, get us to depend upon His Word, get us to endure the hardness that comes with being a good soldier so that there's glory waiting at the end. To obtain the glory. If we suffer, we're glorified with Him. Right? That's what the Scriptures teach us again and again and again. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10. And then after that, I have one verse and then we're done. So two more verses of Scripture. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10. First Peter 5, verse 10. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto His eternal glory. <laughs> there it is again. Not called to salvation. Called to something bigger, 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 much, much bigger than salvation. Much bigger than salvation. Just remember, salvation costs you nothing. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Not a thing. He paid it all. But glory may cost you everything. Glory may cost you everything. But if it's not important to you, then just go about your merry way. 
and it won't concern you at all until probably you hear the trumpet. And then when you hear the trumpet, then it'll matter. And it'll be too late to change the way you walked, to change the way you lived, to change the way you served, to change the way you kept control of your mouth, to change the way you talked about people, the way that you thought about people, the way that you prayed about people. Then it's too late. But like, salvation is the beginning, glory is at the end. And the, and the whole thing in the middle is the captain saying, come on, come on, come on. All right, see it again. But the God of all grace, who had called us unto His eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while. <laughs> okay, yes, somewhere between salvation and heaven, you, you are gonna, you're going to pay a price. After you have suffered a while, make you perfect. Wow, there it is again. Suffering, perfection, glory. Kind of keeps all coming together, doesn't it? Make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. Okay, last verse. Last, last one, and we're going home. First, uh, go to John, the Gospel of John. Gospel of John, chapter 17. Let's hear it from the Lord's own mouth. His high priestly prayer in John chapter 17. Prayed with his disciples there in the upper room before he went to his trial and crucifixion. John chapter 17. Look at verse 4 and 5. 17 verse 4 and 5. This is Jesus praying to his Father, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. So when Jesus Christ left heaven, he left a condition of glory. He was glorified in heaven. He laid all of that glory aside and humbled himself, right? Became a man, took upon him the form of a servant, right? So when he walked through the streets, there wasn't a halo around his head, you know, like in the paintings. He, he, people weren't, you know, blinded by the glory of his appearance as they would have been had he looked on this earth the way he looked in heaven. So he had glory in heaven, but that had to be laid aside. And then he walked on this earth in humility <clears throat> with all of that. All of that had to be taken by faith. You know, when, when he spoke about being the Son of God and being God in the flesh, men had to just take it by faith. They saw miracles, but they didn't see his glory. Only Peter, James, and John got that little glimpse of it when he took them up on the mountain so that they could write about it. But he laid that glory aside. But now his ministry is over. He's ready to go to the cross here. So his, his suffering is not at an end, but he has suffered quite a bit. He's been rejected. He's been misunderstood. His words have been twisted. He has endured the contradiction of sinners against himself. He's about to be beaten. He's about to be spit on. He's about to be nailed. So he knows. But he knows that when this is over, Father, return me to that glory that I had with you before. Right? Of course, but in the middle was all the suffering that was necessary. Had he failed along the way, then it wouldn't have been possible for the Father to glorify Him at the end. But notice, He's not done praying here. Let's go a little, just fast forward. Two more verses in His prayer. Verse number 22. And the glory which Thou gavest Me, I have given them. Ooh. And the glory that Thou gavest Me, He's talking about you and me. He's talking about His disciples. The glory Thou gavest Me, I have given them that they may be one, even as we are one. Notice there's no period there, so we got to keep going, right? I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect. Hmm. So, in bringing many sons unto glory, he was made perfect by the things he suffered. And in bringing you and I there, then there are going to be some things that you and I are going to be called on to suffer too. And you're not forced to do this. I'm not forced to do this. It's, it's a, you have to be willing. You have to be willing. And it's not that you're going to, you know, get martyred. 
but it's just that willingness every day to take up your cross and to follow Jesus Christ. And that glory that the Father, I mean, that Jesus Christ has desired and asked His Father in heaven to give to, to, to share with you and me is part of that being made perfect in one, being made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. All right? Savior, captain of our salvation. Savior, captain, and author in chapter 5. So both of those kind of the same. All right, next time we'll look at Jesus, our brother, and then surprisingly in this chapter, it speaks about Jesus, our father, as our father. And uh, we don't often think of that in that way, but the Bible says that he is also a father. Even in Isaiah 53, it says that God shall see his seed, his seed, Jesus' seed. Psalm chapter 22 speaks about his seed. You know who his seed are? Me and you. And so he's not only a brother, we're going to talk about what it means to have Jesus as an older brother. It's not just a big brother. It's, it's actually something specific in the Old Testament, the, uh, what the firstborn was to be to his brothers and sisters. He is our firstborn, firstborn among many brethren. All right, so we'll look at that the next time. Thank you for being here tonight. Let's pray. Father, Lord God, we thank you for our Savior. Lord, what an amazing, what an amazing book, and thank you for being who you are. Thank you for saving us, and thank you, Lord, that the Scriptures give us an understanding about the purpose of this life. Lord, um, the sufferings and the trials of the Christian life don't make any sense unless we understand where this is going and what you intended and what you're trying to work in our lives by these things. And so help us, Lord, if any one of us may be called upon to suffer things that we don't understand. Lord, give us the grace. Uh, give us the grace to be able to go through those things with joy and to keep our eyes on you. I thank you for my brothers and sisters here tonight. So thankful, Lord, that we can make this journey together. And I pray you bless them and keep them. Get everybody home safely tonight. And help us this week, Lord, uh, whether it's at school or work or in a restaurant, wherever we may be, help us to remember that people are watching. There is always opportunities, Lord, to give somebody a track or tell somebody about Jesus Christ. And I pray that we might be mindful to do that. And uh, we just pray your blessings upon those things. And uh, thank you for all these things, Lord, tonight. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.